My name is Bruce Fisk, uh, and uh, today's webinar, today's NIMI webinar, is entitled What's Next for Gaza for Israel? And I'm honored to host a conversation with Palestinian human rights lawyer Jonathan Kutab. Exactly two months ago today, Hamas launched a surprise attack on Israel, brutally killing some 1,200 people, including 33 children. Thousands were injured. Testimony and raw video are emerging showing sexual assault, horrific abuse, and slaughter by Hamas militants. Hamas captured some 250 people, including 34 children, 138 of which are still captive. Anguished families are demanding their return. An Israeli Jewish friend, who might or might not be on the call today, shared with me her latest poem. Here's just a small part of her lament. The Lord's song pours forth in grief, in groans that cannot be uttered. The Lord's song pours forth in weeping, in cascades of soundless tears. The Lord's song pours forth lament, in anguish fused with faith. Turning to Gaza, OSHA is reporting almost 16,000 dead. Some numbers go up to 17,000, more than 4,000 women and 6,000 children. An estimated 7,000 more are buried under rubble. A single airstrike kills 68 members of the extended Jude family. Another attack killed Palestinian journalist Mohammed Abu Hasira and 42 members of his family. A former Pentagon official thinks the closest comparisons to so many large bombs falling in sm such a small area are the Vietnam War or World War II. 80% of Gaza's 2.2 million have been forcibly displaced. People who fled south are fleeing again, then again from bombing, but nowhere in Gaza is safe. Shelters have no capacity. The healthcare system is collapsing. Absent is clean drinking water sanitation, fuel, nutrition. The Rafah closing into Egypt is overwhelmed and the aid entering from there is grossly inadequate. Ambulances are coming under fire. Epidemics are inevitable. In the West Bank, East Jerusalem, clashes and raids are increasing. In refugee camps like Janine and Kalandia, in Ramallah, in Bethlehem, there have been more than 300 settler attacks. Israeli forces have killed 256 Palestinians and arrested more than 3,000 since October 7th. A thousand more have been forced off their land. Palestinians have killed four Israelis. Bethlehem has canceled Christmas this year. Meanwhile, the U.S. is looking to provide traumatized, sorry, the U.S. is looking to, to provide Israel with an additional $10.1 billion in unconditional military aid. So Israel today is a nation traumatized, grieving, outraged. October 7 is Israel's 9-11, another Kristallnacht, the worst slaughter of Jews since the Holocaust. It's a nation united in its grief and in its desire to avenge the Hamas slaughter and its fear of rising anti-Semitism around the world. Palestine today is a nation besieged, threatened, collectively punished, contained, and displaced. This nation is united in its suffering, its desperation, its trauma. Jonathan Kutab joins us today to help us understand what is happening and where this is going. Jonathan, you get to ask, you get asked to do this a lot, and, and our viewers will soon see why. Jonathan Kutab is a widely respected Palestinian American human rights lawyer, well known for legal advocacy and a commitment to nonviolence. Please read his bio on our NIMI website and, and visit his website, jonathankutab.org. Coming from the Palestinian Christ, Christian community, John's, Jonathan's voice is one of wisdom and sanity. So I said, my name is Bruce Fisk. I'm NIMI's re senior research fellow. Grateful to be hosting this conversation today with Jonathan. The Network of Evangelicals for the Middle East is a coalition of evangelical leaders and lay people who believe evangelicals need to talk. Evangelicals have often obstructed Middle East peace. We think we can do better. 
Mimi has hosted a series of conversations this year about peacemaking. It's a theme we chose long before October 7th. We want our work, our website, our conversations, our events to support you as you pray and labor with us. If you have questions during the conversation today, you can post them in the chat and my colleague, Mercy Aiken will be monitoring them. Jonathan, welcome. It's good to see you again. First, take a few minutes, would you? And just tell us what the last two months have been like for you personally. It's been very difficult. It's been very traumatic. I think that one of the first things that come to mind is this whole thing didn't start on October the 7th. Now, October 7th was, was an explosion of a pressure cooker uh, that's been oppressing Palestinians in, in general and Gazans in particular uh, for many years. They've been under siege for 16 years. They've been living under occupation, oppression, apartheid, uh, discrimination, and, and, and they blew up. And they blew up in a very, very uh, violent uh, way, and they uh, committed many crimes, war crimes, as well as attacking soldiers on that day. Uh, but it didn't start on October 1st, uh, 7th. That's, that's the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, the, the second tell thing me, that's... Tell me more about what... Tell me more about what you've been doing over the last two months. Have you been traveling in the U.S. and speaking? And have you had some difficult conversations? I have. The hardest part for me has been listening to uh, the news uh, in Israel, in Hebrew, as well as in Arabic from Mayadeen and Jazeera and other sources. You get a totally different picture than you get in this country. Uh, when you listen to them. And it's a very painful one. Uh, one of the things that hit me most is uh, how people talk past each other. They have no concept and no ability almost to feel the pain of the other side. Uh, I mean, I have some very good Israeli friends who say we have no room to think about the grief and the suffering of Palestinians. We are so totally absorbed in our own trauma and grief. And, and I'm sure on the, on the Arab side also, there are many who just see the oppression of the Palestinians and who see the overwhelming power of the Israeli army, and, and they have very little compassion uh, for the hostages. They say, well, we have about 9,000 Palestinian prisoners who have also been yanked out of their homes and, and, and kidnapped and taken and put in prison. Uh, and and uh, so we are so full of our pain that we don't have enough compassion to feel the pain of the others. Uh, that, that is the first thing that, that really uh, strikes me about the current situation. The absence of empathy, the inability to feel the pain of the other side. Jonathan, if this webinar webinar ended right now, I think we'd all take with us something uh, that we can ponder for a long time. Thank you for that thought. Let's turn to some of the, I mean, you know the American scene as well, and you're tracking that in addition to the Palestinian and Jewish communities uh, in, in Israel, Palestine. Uh, so I want to turn to some, <clears throat> some questions that relate to American evangelicals and get you to think out loud with us. I mean, first of all, American evangelicals are defending, many of them, Israel's behavior right now in Gaza. I mean, there's been a two-month-long bombing campaign. And just yesterday, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, summoned the, the UN Security Council. They're going to have a debate tomorrow. This is a big deal. Groups like Amnesty International, Doctors Without Borders are calling for a ceasefire. The Pope is calling for a ceasefire. But America and many American evangelicals uh, don't want to put pressure on Israel uh, and don't want to call for a ceasefire. I, I want to think with you about that. Now, as we both know, uh, for many of these evangelical defenders of Israel, uh, this is tied up in uh, beliefs about the end times. Uh, something like 60% of American evangelicals believe we are living in the last days, according to a Pew survey. 
But end times is not the only reason evangelicals are siding with Israel. We can talk about that one if you want, but I also want to mention a couple of others and then open it up for you to, to react to them. The first uh, response that you hear from Americans, from the White House, but also from many American evangelicals is the standard phrase that Israel has a right to defend itself. We heard this from uh, Joe Biden. Uh, we've heard it from Russell Moore of Christianity Today. Uh, Jonathan, uh, we all knew that Israel was gonna respond after October the 7th, uh, but the scale of Israel's bombing campaign is raising questions about self-defense, even what it means and what it what it what its limits are. How are you thinking uh, today, Jonathan, about uh, Israel's right to self-defense and the appeal to that um, as a reason to continue to support Israel's project in Gaza? Well, before I address that, and 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 I'd just like to leave the little thought in your mind: is do Palestinians have the right to defend themselves as well? Uh -huh. But leave that aside. The, the, the thing that struck me most about uh, American media during this uh, period was how uniform and consistent the, uh, the formal media in this country, the corporate media has been. From the right to the left, from Fox News to MSNBC uh, to CNN, the theme has been consistent persistent party line. I never thought that, that I, I thought in totalitarian regimes, you'd have the, the, the media uh, parrot the party line. But I've never thought that in an open society, in a free society, there'll be so much consistency in providing one straight, clear line, and that anybody who deviates from it gets immediately pounced upon and totally demonized. And, and the theme is so very what's clear. Wrong with that argument? What, well, what's, what's wrong, wrong with the argument that Israel is, is, is defending itself? Okay. What, what's wrong with that argument is, is, is that, yes, of course, every country has a right to defend itself. And the Palestinians have the right to defend themselves. That's not the issue. The issue is, how do you go about it? Are there any rules? Are there any limits? Are there any other ways of dealing with it other than to place the goal of a total eradication of your enemy as the legitimate goal of the war. Uh, the war, uh, the, the, the idea was that Palestinians almost didn't exist. Certainly the people in Gaza didn't exist in the Israeli mind or psyche at all. All of a sudden they existed and they needed to be pushed back where they belong, out of mind, totally irrelevant. And the way you do it is you totally demonize Hamas and you place the object of eradicating Hamas as a legitimate objective. And whatever it takes, if they are above ground, we have to move everything above ground so we can hit them. If we have to move 1.2 million people out of the way, fine. If we have to use huge bombs, 2,000 pound bombs, to kill one person, fine. If we kill other people, why they fine. If we have to cut off all their water and, and, and food and medical supplies and do whatever it takes, fine. It is legitimate because we have already created a narrative. And once you okay, accept so, that narrative, everything else flows from it. Okay, so so that has led that leads to the second theme that we hear very very commonly, and we hear it amongst uh, Americans. We also hear it uh, in the uh, in the evangelical community here. Uh, it's related to what you've been talking about, and that is the theme that uh, Israel is doing everything it can to avoid civilian casualties. That the Israeli uh, military is uh, you're laughing. It, it, that the well, Israeli I, I'm laughing is, because uh, Israelis themselves don't make that claim. That claim is only made well, in me, the United States. Let, in Israel, they you. said accuracy is not important. Destruction is important. We have to destroy yeah. them. So you, you, you um, I should mention to our viewers that there may be a little bit of a delay between us. I'm coming to you from from uh, Latin America, from Peru. So there's a, a, quite a distance for the signal to travel. Uh, Mark Regev, 
uh, Jonathan. He's the senior advisor to Netanyahu. He said just a couple of days ago, uh, looking into the camera, I think, this is a quote, I think it will be seen that the IDF really has done everything that is humanly possible to try to safeguard civilians. So that's that's uh, a spokesperson and an advisor to Netanyahu. Now, okay, we might expect that from you know, Netanyahu's uh, uh, administration, but many evangelicals agree and would parrot the same kind of language. That's the way they say, see it too. Uh, I'll just quote one, um, Baruch Maoz. Uh, he's an Israeli Jewish American Christian pastor. Um, he was pastoring in Israel. Now he's in the U.S. Uh, he claims, and here's another quote, that Israel has done and is doing more than any armor, our army ever anywhere in the world to avoid civilian deaths in Gaza. Again, Israel has done and is doing more than any army ever anywhere in the world to avoid civilian deaths in Gaza. So, um, so I guess we should just expect this scale of civilian casualties. Uh, Israel is doing better, better than most to to prevent them. Um, oh. Your that, that, that is simply that is simply not true. Uh, not not in terms of the actions and not in terms of the results. Israel has managed to kill a higher percentage of, of civilians, of total people, in two months uh, than, 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 I mean, 1% of the population of Gaza has been killed. How, how is that in any way, in, in, in two months, in a very short uh, uh, area, how is that? Uh, I, I just don't understand that claim. That's totally a self serving claim. Uh, but, but, but I will say one, one more step. Israel has been very clear of its intent to destroy. It has used very racist language. They are human animals. They should be destroyed. They cut off the water. They cut off the food. They cut off the electricity and the fuel. Now, how can you say I am trying to limit civilian casualties when I cut off their water, when I cut, cut off their electricity, when I cut off their food. Uh, the, 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 the level of destruction has been so huge. The language use has been so racist and dehumanizing. In fact, Netanyahu even used the word Amalek which which uh, I think people who know the Bible are familiar, uh, that is the destruction, the total genocide of the tribe of Amalek. And, and even Jewish religious people will tell you that that is no longer operative because we don't know who Amalek is. Well, Netanyahu is saying, I know who Amalek is. The Bible orders me to totally destroy my enemy. Men, women, children, and animals. So when you use the language of Amalek, you can't very well at the same time say, oh, but I want to avoid civilian casualties, uh, because clearly you're not avoiding civilian casualties. But I'm hearing at least three different arguments here that are response. One is just the scale, the sheer scale, the numbers of Palestinians that have been killed. Uh, another is the uh, the damage to the infrastructure that amounts to collective punishment, cutting off water, etc. Um, and then uh, this uh, this this rhetoric that the rhetoric of violence, the rhetoric of dehumanization, and uh, within that, uh, you've pointed out the uh, weaponization of scripture, of the Bible. For those who have ears to hear, uh, that's uh, that can be a bit of a dog whistle, a bit of a trigger, uh, a signaling that we're not just dealing with uh, a hierarchy, we're dealing with an entire people that uh, are, represent the enemy of, of Israel and, and need to be, with God's blessing, eliminated. Do I Have I caught the, the, the general sense of, of, your, uh, yes. of your response? Yes, I'm, and, 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 and while we are at it, I think we should point out that we really have had uh, an absence of the Christian, the evangelical voice in this. Uh, all the arguments that have been used have been basically parroting 
the political arguments that are dominant in the uh, discourse of uh, basically the secular press. They have been repeating the same political argument. I don't see a Christian voice here. Uh, I don't see uh, any compassion. I don't see any turning the other cheek. I don't see uh, f- uh, f- uh, loving your enemy. I don't see peace on earth. I don't see the way of the cross. Uh, all I see is a parroting of the arguments, the political arguments of the world, rather than a genuinely uh, Christian response. Uh, unless, of course, you want yeah. to talk about the end time, the prophecy, uh, which, uh, which which some people are willing to talk about. We, we can get to that if we have time. Um, but I, again, to reiterate some of the points you're making, uh, the, the 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 main point you just made is that um, that you're not hearing from Christians anything that's particularly Christian. You're hearing uh, reiteration of arguments that could be you could describe them as secular or political, but not theological or Christian. Uh, we want to uh, keep that question sort of uh, um, simmering while we turn to uh, the Palestinian community and to Hamas, because some of these same uh, evangelical Christians are going to want to talk to you about uh, the role of Hamas in threatening uh, Israel and threatening the Jews. And uh, just to um, just to just before we turn there, um, I want to say that um, surely some of these evangelicals are sincere in their lament for Palestinian deaths. Uh, but they seem to be able to distinguish between uh, a lament for Christian for Palestinian deaths, and a condemnation of the attack. So they're not willing to call for an end to the attack, but as the the, the body count mounts, they are, I, I assume, sincere in their in their grief. Uh, it just seems to me a, an interesting uh, tension or contrast. Let's turn to uh, to some other themes that we hear when we start talking about Palestinians. We've talked about Israel, their right to defend themselves and uh, the argument that they're doing what they can to, uh, to uh, protect civilians and, and avoid civilian casualties. But that gets specifically to this next theme, and that is uh, about Palestinian resistance, and particularly Hamas. Uh, many Christians, evangelical Christians, would simply point to Hamas as an ex- existential threat to the Jews, to the Jewish people. Uh, Hamas is a terrorist organization, end of discussion, right? That's all we need really to say. Some of them would put it in sort of metaphysical terms. We're we're in a war, engage, Israel's in a war engaged between uh, light and darkness. Of course, Israel is on the side of light. Hamas is on the side of darkness. Uh, Hamas is pure evil. Um, we we have to support Israel in its, in its uh, desperate need to resist the evil that surrounds it, and then it's wanting to destroy it. So that's one point. I'll, I'll put two points out for you to respond to. Uh, and the other one is uh, huge. This one is in all the conversations everywhere. You've heard it a thousand times. And that is that Hamas embeds itself among civilians. Hamas's tactics are, are to use civilians as human shields. So some would even say Hamas is forcing Israel to kill Gaza. Um, let me get you to respond to that. The binary paradigm of light and darkness, all light on one side, all darkness on the other. And the the real charge that has some substance, that Israel is embedding itself in uh, urban centers, in, in, in civilian areas, and therefore drawing the fire of Israel and, in a sense, intentionally putting its own people in jeopardy. Right. Talk to us about that. Well, let's start with the first one. And, and I want to make it clear, I am no apologist for Hamas. And, and I do not like their uh, philosophy. I don't like their doctrines. I don't like their methods. Uh, but, but there's no question that Hamas is, uh, represents uh, an enemy to the state of Israel that's been tied in a, in, in a fight with it for a very long time, just as Israel presents an enemy to the Palestinian people, and and they are locked in in, in a struggle, uh, some people think in an existential struggle, uh, 
Uh, each side thinks that Palestine belongs to it or Israel belongs to it, and, and that the other side is its enemy because it refuses to acknowledge its rights. Uh, so, so there is a struggle between these two, there's no question. Now, the Palestinians, like the Israelis, have the right to self-defense and have the right to armed struggle. I simply don't think it's a good thing to use armed struggle. And if you do want to use armed struggle, you should avoid civilian casualties. You should not be involved in war crimes and crimes against humanity. That's clear to me. But but the, the, this idea of totally demonizing your enemy. I mean, I can talk about Israeli radicals. I can talk about Netanyahu. I can talk about being veer. I can talk about the Likud party. I can talk about how right-wing and fascist and racist they are. I can talk about an apartheid regime uh, that, that, that has Jewish supremacy at its heart. Uh, but then when I demonize them and make them so evil that they need to be destroyed and that anything that, that is done to destroy them is legitimate, then, then I, I fail, I lose. Uh, the, these two conflicting theories, ideas, ideologies uh, and, and need to reconcile somehow, need to come together, uh, need to uh, find a way of dealing with the differences other than to totally kill and destroy the other side. Because it's not possible. So, so, Violence is not so an option. The, well, so, so this is on the first point, and that is this binary framing yes. of, of the conflict in terms of light and darkness. Let me ask you a follow-up question before we go on to the second part. And that is, um, when you described at the beginning the fact that Israel and Hamas, uh, or Israel and the Palestinians, are in somewhat of a uh, an enmity relationship, a struggle, were you describing a certain sector of Israeli society and a certain sector of Palestinian society, or were you wanting to, to apply that kind of um, zero-sum thinking across the spectrum? Do you, do you think there's a, a, a majority or a, a quiet majority within Israel and within Palestine that doesn't demonize, or is this, is this just not the moment for that kind of balanced, non-traumatized thinking to occur? Well, that None, uh, th that non traumatized thinking is required. And sooner or later, we have to come to terms with each other. Uh, Palestinians have to come to terms with the fact that Zionists, for whatever reason, who came and took their land, are living there and need to be dealt with. And Zionist Israelis need to learn that this land was not empty, that it has a people in it, a society, a culture. Uh, and they need to be to come to terms with that sooner or later that that discussion is absolutely required and to totally negate the other delegitimize the other demonize the other try to destroy the other disenfranchise them not give them equal rights throw them into the sea into the desert send them into the sinai uh, whatever you want to do uh, simply is not going to work we need to learn to live with each other. But now I need to come to your second argument. This argument of human shields, that somehow Hamas, by embedding itself in Palestinian society, has made all Palestinian society a legitimate target. Now, even if it's true that there was a Hamas headquarters at, at the bottom of a hospital, which was not proven, by the way. No evidence was shown to that at all. But even if it was true, it doesn't mean you go and destroy a hospital. It doesn't give you permission to go and kill all these innocent people. Never mind that there were 50 other hospitals that were also attacked and schools were attacked. And 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 uh, residential buildings were attacked. Uh, uh, all of them were attacked. It is not legitimate to do so. Now, I know every single resistance movement always lives within a sea of a community uh, that 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 it interacts with, 
But that doesn't mean that that entire community be, therefore becomes a legitimate target. I mean, think about it. If a very totally evil person goes and embeds themselves in a school and has all these hostages around them as human shields, which is what this argument is, does that mean you should go and destroy that school and kill all the children in order to get that evil person in the middle? No, it doesn't. Even if we accept that argument, it does not justify killing all those civilians or using huge bombs, 2,000 pound bombs, relentlessly dropping bomb after bomb after bomb, creating these huge crates in the middle of, 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 of an apartment block. And people stand around it. They can't believe what they are seeing. Even if there was one, one Hamas commander somehow suspected to be there. Uh, so so that, that argument of, of human shields is just a way to deflect the moral responsibility of attacking otherwise totally civilian uh, targets. And it's not a legitimate argument. Sorry, I do not buy it. Yeah. Let, let me let me throw out a few additional thoughts and get your reaction to them. I mean, uh, you're you're first of all making the point that um, whether or not uh, Hamas is is embedded, uh, that that itself doesn't uh, mean all uh, bets are off and all um, tactics are allowed. Uh, let me read to you a quote from uh, Human Rights Watch. Uh, it says. Uh, Human Rights Watch says, quote, the presence of a Hamas commander or a rocket launcher or other military facility in a populated area would not justify attacking the area without regard to the threatened civilian population, including the duty to distinguish combatants from civilians and the rule of proportionality. So there's still these rules. If we're going to play by the game, play by the rules of, of uh, international humanitarian law, and the laws of war that require proportionality and distinction between civilians and captives. Now, another point, I saw you nodding your head to that one. Another point that we could make here is uh, often not acknowledged, and that is back in 1947, 1948, when uh, various uh, militias, Zionist militias, were working against the British, uh, and against the Palestinians, uh, there they are. They were embedding themselves and storing all kinds of munitions in all sorts of uh, civilian buildings around Tel Aviv and in other towns. In fact, I just read recently that there's more than 50, five zero, more than 50 plaques in uh, towns and cities around Israel uh, declaring that this or that site was used by these militias, Irgun, Lehi, to, to, to hide munitions, to hide headquarters. These were civilian targets or civilian buildings that were being used. And, and these were militias that were embedding themselves in the civilian uh, society uh, in the pre-state uh, Israeli uh, context. So it's it seems kind of parallel, sounds kind of familiar to me when we start criticizing uh, one group for doing it. Uh, when the other group has has um, celebrated it by putting bronze plaques around uh, around Israel, comments on that? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, I think we have to understand that argument totally within the framework of trying to provide a moral justification, rather than really accepting it as a legitimate argument. Also, it invites you to accept their word for it. We have intelligence. We know. Trust us. Uh, we know that this hospital is used as headquarters. No proof whatsoever. Later, we find out that it was Israel itself. Ehud Barak said, we built uh, a, an operating uh, room with tunnels under the Shifa hospital ourselves in 1983. So we know there was an operating room under the hospital. Uh, the, the, the question is, is this just the excuse to explain the civilian casualties rather than, 
rather than really a legitimate uh, reason. Uh, you, you said it correctly. International law insists on distinctions between combatants and non-combatants. Uh, it's called the principle of discrimination. It also insists on proportionality. If there is a military target and you're likely to hurt uh, civilians, there should be proportionality. How important is that military target and how many civilians are going to be killed? Uh, to does it is it legitimate to go after that target when there is so much uh, when there are so many uh, civilians around? Uh, if an airplane has a civilian airplane has a a high value target, uh, do you kill all the passengers? Do you shoot down that plane? Is that legitimate? And international law says no, you cannot. So another question I have for you on this same topic. Um, it seems to me that both Hamas and uh, the Israeli forces are using civilian uh, targeting to put pressure on uh, their governments to, to respond. So Hamas attacks civilians to get civilian angst and anger uh, against their government for not protecting them. And somehow that will make their government uh, act in a way that Hamas approves. Meanwhile, Israel is attacking Palestinian civilians to get them to rise up against and throw off Hamas. Uh, they're both using civilians, uh, I would say malevolently, to pressure their governments. And that strikes me on both sides as a, a textbook definition of collective punishment. Uh, your, your thoughts? Correct, correct. I think any use of civilians uh, to achieve political uh, goals is, is terrorism. This is the definition of terrorism. When you attack civilians in order to uh, force uh, the government uh, to do something and uh, that, that you want, uh, that, that it's not doing otherwise. Uh, so, so yes, I would say Hamas has violated international law by taking civilians hostages and by targeting civilian uh, targets and by shooting rockets indiscriminately at civilian targets. Uh, I think that's illegal, and that is wrong, and should not be done. But by the same token, when Israel attacks Palestinian civilians, uh, I think it is equally wrong and illegal. The fact that they do it from uh, high uh, in the air, uh, and, and, and trust us and trust our intelligence that we know what we are doing, uh, I, I don't think justifies that. So uh, a year and a half ago, you wrote a piece and it was entitled, Is It Time to Talk to Hamas? That probably seems like a long time ago. But you provocatively suggested in that piece that um, while you reject uh, Hamas's political philosophy and you say Hamas has failed the people of Gaza, you also said that excluding Hamas from the political process has not helped. I'm wondering if you had to rewrite that article today, would you write it differently? Um, is dialogue with the Islamic resistance movement possible? Has your mind evolved in your thinking given the events of October 7th? To the contrary, I think it is all the more true now than it was then. It's all the more true now because it shows if you don't engage them, if you don't have dialogue with them, if you don't try to get them to change their minds or at least to change their tactics, if you don't take their offers at a long-term 10, 15 year hudna, which they wanted as, as if you don't urge them to change their charter, which by the way, they changed. Uh, if you don't engage them and bring them into the political process, why you're only telling them the only thing that works for you is violence, is armed attacks, is terrorism. Uh, I would say all the more the fact that Israel has ignored and in fact used Hamas to control its own people and was perfectly comfortable with it. The fact that they were so comfortable that they would have a music festival two kilometers from the border, enjoying themselves, enjoying the good life and totally being unaware that there's 2.2 million people who are living in an open-air prison right next to them. 
uh, I think ex- uh, explains exactly the kind of mentality. And of course, the shock that came when, when, when these people started actually acting on, on, on their ideology, acting on their belief in armed struggle, acting on their resistance doctrines, because you felt they are too weak, they can do nothing. And when they did do mm-hmm. something, all of a sudden you're shocked, you are humiliated, you are traumatized, and you say, but we're the powerful people. Let's show them our power. Uh, and and uh, Pre- President Herzog was very clear. He says there's no innocent civilians in Gaza. It is not true. They're all guilty. Either they voted for Hamas or they failed to overthrow Hamas by coup d'etat. So they're all guilty. This is what President Herzog said, uh, that, that, that somehow there are no civilians. There are no innocent civilians in Gaza. So you can kill them. You can drop your bombs. You can cut off their food. You can, you can do whatever you want. Because in his mind, there's only three kinds of, of, of Palestinians. There's Hamas, those who voted for Hamas, those who are sympathetic to Hamas, and those who are human shields for Hamas. All three categories are legitimate targets, and we can go and kill to our heart's content. Uh, and I mean, those comments from Herzog are uh, are troubling. Uh, uh, of course, we know that in the Israeli uh, Knesset right now, the the coalition that that Netanyahu has formed it consists of, of parties and figures who are far to the right of Herzog, and who are uh, calling for explicitly calling for uh, various kinds of ethnic cleansing. Uh, and so there's there's a, a right wing hardening that's going on at, at the top in Israeli society. But let's keep the focus on Hamas for another minute. I mean, would you agree that Hamas at its core is ideologically anti-Semitic uh, or not? A lot of people say, yes, it is. And of course, they point to the first charter that Yassin drafted back in, I think it was 1988, the first Hamas charter that was explicitly anti-Jewish in its rhetoric, very hostile to Jews. The second charter comes out in 2018, and and now it tries to make a very sharp distinction between Jews as a people and Zionism as a project. And so they seem to be pushing away from anti-Semitism toward anti-Zionism. And yet today, of course, in America and in so many places, the two are being being, uh, connected or equated. If you're anti-Zionist, you're an anti-Semite. But tell us what Hamas wants. What is their end game? Uh, how did how do you understand their project? Well, Hamas, it's funny. When Hamas first started, Israel supported Hamas as an antidote to Palestinian nationalism, to secular nationalism. So they emphasized uh, Islam. They emphasized the need to create an Islamic state. Now, I'm totally opposed to an Islamic state, just as I'm opposed to a, a, a Christian state or a, or a Baptist state or a, or a Jewish state uh, because then what do you do with non-Jews? What do you do with non-Baptists? What do you do with non-Muslims in such a state? Uh, so, so the idea of Hamas wanting an Islamic uh, political entity uh, I, I'm opposed to. And it has nothing to do with being anti-Semitic. Uh, I think that, uh, like all Palestinians, uh, we have a problem with Zionism. We have a problem with those who say uh, that our land, Palestine, uh, belongs to Jews. Well, what about us? Uh, so so the, the problem of Zionism and anti-Semitism is, is, is a real serious problem for Israel uh, because it, it places them in an... Uh, uh, in an attitude where it's difficult to separate church from state, religion from uh, politics. Uh, because they are saying, we are a Jewish state. We welcome Jews from all over the world. We have public institutions that serve Jews only and not non-Jews. We refuse to accept the principle of equality of all of our citizens. We favor Jews. This is who we are. Uh, so that 
that forces you into a situation where you have an apartheid regime, or at least a Jewish supremacist regime, uh, which is opposed by me, by by, by and I think by uh, people of goodwill everywhere in the world. Uh, the idea of a state, uh, the idea of a state that constitutionally makes claims on behalf of Jews that it refuses to make on behalf of its other citizens. Never mind the people so, that it, it rules and controls. So I'm hearing you say that uh, a hard Zionist uh, regime privileges Jews and a hard Hamas Islamist regime would privilege Muslims. And both of those are problematic, deeply problematic. We've got to move away from that kind of hierarchical uh, paradigm in both directions. We just have a couple of minutes before we're going to go to questions, and I wanted us to turn our attention toward the future. Uh, you know, in uh, in Lutheran Christmas Church in Bethlehem, which we both know very well, um, the uh, baby Jesus isn't lying on uh, in a manger on the straw this year. Uh, baby Jesus is lying on a mound of broken concrete uh, somewhere in Gaza. And I want to say that I want to read that as an invitation to see hope amidst the rubble. Um, the war is far from over. Um, there's talk even at the highest levels in Israel of pushing, uh, cleansing uh, Gaza and pushing Palestinians into the Sinai. Uh, so I want to I want to ask if you uh, see any reasons to hope as we look into the future. Where are things headed for Gaza and for Israel? What do we dare hope for? Well, uh, as, as you know, I think hope is very different from optimism. I'm not optimistic. We are in the midst of a genocide. We are in the midst of an attempt to ethnically cleanse Palestinians from Gaza and from the West Bank, actually. Uh, because those same uh, people that you mentioned are also thinking of how do we get rid of people in the West Bank and push them into Jordan. So in the short term, it looks very bad. In the long term, it may provide some basis for hope. And let me explain that. I think this war has shown that violence is not the answer. Violence cannot give Palestinians freedom and liberty. Violence cannot give Israel security. Even with every possible advantage militarily. They, they thought they had Gaza totally controlled. They had a fence around it that was the latest in technology with sensors underground, above ground, and in the sky. Uh, they had automatic uh, machine guns that will shoot at anything that moves within one, one kilometer of the border automatically, whether they are hostile or not. Uh, they, they had the latest in technology, the latest in, 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 in military power. And that whole thing collapsed in a matter of hours and was breached by, by a people who were totally controlled and totally uh, surrounded and totally vanquished and yet they managed to uh, to show that you can't really have security. Unfortunately, many people in Israel just double down. Maybe we need to have more power, uh, more weapons. So, uh, so, so you, you uh, but but, but you, I find you, you, hope. Yeah. I find hope in in the idea that military power alone does not provide security does not provide liberation. So we must think in other terms. I, Jonathan, I, after I started this uh, conversation saying that you left us with something profound at the very beginning that was worth the, the, the whole webinar, I think that's another one of those points that you just made for us. Uh, and that is what we can see in this uh, horrible catastrophe is, is the ineffectiveness and ultimately the failure of violence to bring security and peace to people. I have one last question for you. And as I ask it, Mercy, if you want to join us, uh, we, we're going to uh, let you post some questions that have come from the uh, from the uh, the viewers. My last question is, Jonathan, 
offer a word to the church, to the American evangelical church. Everybody gets to listen in here, but I'm particularly interested in you speaking to the American evangelical crowd. Um, how can we be a better part of a solution here and not part of the problem? Uh, what's, what's your word for evangelicals today? Make it brief if you can, and then Mercy, you can jump in with some questions. Well, I, I, I think that as followers of Jesus, the Prince of Peace, we have a message to the world that is different from the message that the world hears. The world believes in power and military power, uh, believes that we should fight to defend our country, defend our homes uh, against our enemies, that it's okay to go and kill them because they are evil people and we are good people and we should uh, fight them. The, the message of Christ is different and it's a radical one. It says, no, you should love your enemies. Uh, I came to bring the kingdom of God into their hearts. Uh, I came to teach people uh, what what uh, the kingdom of God means. A kingdom of peace where the lion and the lamb lie together and a, and a child will lead them. I give them a vision of a better society, an alternative to killing, an alternative to violence. I'd like to hear the church Echo that message rather than repeat the political points that we hear every day about violence and killing and destroying and eradicating the evil one, in this case, Hamas and, and the Palestinians and the right to self-defense uh, and, and the right to close your eyes to the humanity of the other side and only insist on your own side. This is the message that Christians have. That is why it's good news. It's good news, especially at Christmas. This should be our message. And I don't hear that from the church. I, I, I see them almost Mercy. reluctant to use the word ceasefire as if that's a dirty word. Yeah, Mercy, join us. And, and uh, what, what questions do you think would be helpful to discuss at this point? Thanks, uh, Bruce and Jonathan. I just want to just tag on what you just said, Jonathan, I so appreciate the Palestinian church for um, really kind of leading the charge in talking about these very things that you mentioned. And I'm thankful that um, more than usual, there have been interviews with people like Munther Isak and others all over the news, which we haven't seen in the past. So I also take that as a small sign of hope. Um, there's the chat has been very, very active. There's a ton of questions. Um, I, I would like to start with a question from Jurgen Rose, which I think is a really important question. And he asks, will Jonathan be given a chance to talk about future scenarios for Gaza? Um, Jonathan, like anything you would want to speak to that future scenarios for Gaza, yeah. how, how you could see this, um, yeah. working. Gaza is part of Palestine. Gaza is not just a small little isolated area. Two thirds of the residents of Gaza are actually refugees who lost their homes and lands when Israel was created in 1948. So to think about what is the solution for Gaza without thinking about what is the solution for all Palestinians is, 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 is really very short sighted. Gaza is part of Palestine. Palestinians have rights in Palestine. So the question is, how do you reconcile those rights with rights or claims that Israelis and Zionists have in the same territory? And the idea of creating two states, one state called Israel and the other called Palestine in sort of West Bank and Gaza, uh, has been offered, hasn't worked very well, mostly because Israelis insisted on setting up Jewish settlements throughout uh, the, the West Bank and on uh, keeping Gaza totally enclosed and separated from the West Bank and the rest of the world. Uh, so that's not a solution. The solution has to encompass all of Palestine. Palestinians should have rights, and the determining factor should not be who has power, 
but where does justice lie? And justice includes equality. Justice includes democracy. Justice includes freedom of movement. Justice includes access to resources, land and water resources. Justice includes the right of return. If Jews claim a right of return after 2000 years, then Palestinians definitely have a right of return within their own lifetime if they choose to exercise it. So justice- Jonathan is... has written- Go ahead. Jonathan has written a book on the subject uh, beyond the two-state solution. It's a small book that's very accessible. Uh, it, it punches above its weight. It's a very powerful proposal for a kind of one-state solution going forward. So uh, to hear more about his thinking on that, I would encourage you to go on his website and uh, get a hold of that book. Um, Mercy, do you have another question? Um, there, there was a lot of questions sort of challenging uh, this conversation in regard to the way that we were framing some of the questions in the beginning. Um, one such, um, please explain why you think Hamas is a terrorist organization. One man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. Why do you not say Israel is a terrorist organization? I would say that's sort of um, a question that encompasses a lot of the others that were coming in along those lines. And because there were so many, um, I'd like to just present it to you guys also um, to answer. I think I think these questions may have been answered in the discussion after people posted these questions, but nevertheless, I want to give opportunity. Yeah, it's a good it's a good one, Jonathan. What do you what do you say to that? Uh, well, that uh, question. Uh, I I think the, the same idea was talked about the PLO for many years. People refuse to talk to the PLO. They say the PLO is a terrorist organization. Their charter says this. Their actions are that. They believe in armed struggle. They don't accept Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state. Da, 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 da. All these arguments were used to avoid dealing with uh, the PLO. Eventually, people did deal with the PLO. and They dealt with Arafat, and he changed the charter. And, and he started a process. Unfortunately, it's a process that eventually collapsed. Uh, but, but certainly, if we start from a zero-sum solution, if you start with the Charter of Likud or even the laws of the State of Israel or its current government, you can easily say, what's the point? They are hopeless. Uh, listen to what they say. Look at what they do. We can't deal with them. They are evil. Uh, we just have to fight them and kill them and destroy them. Or you can say, let's talk to them. Let's try to understand them. Let's engage with them. We may not agree with them. Maybe we can get them to change their mind, change their charter, change their political program, or at least change their behavior, or at least find different ways uh, to, to, to pursue their political objectives. I mean, people are constantly telling Palestinians, why don't you use nonviolence? And we do. So we try BDS, boycotts, divestment, and sanctions. We try going to the UN and going to the International Commission uh, Criminal Court. Uh, we try protesting. We try boycotts. Uh, I don't hear people asking the Israelis, why don't you try nonviolence for a change? Why don't you try relying on something other than firepower, other than your air force, other than your army? Why don't you try something other than ruling and dominating and conquering other people? Why don't you engage in talking to them? Uh, you, you may not like what you hear and you may it may be a painful and a long and a difficult process, but, but it may yield better results than just killing them or boycotting them or demonizing them. There's no question there is a conflict here. There are, there are disputes. And the question is, can we deal with them rather than simply demonize our enemies? Great, great comment. Uh, Mercy, do we have time for uh, one or two more? Uh, I don't know when we um, have to- Yeah, I'm, I think we can 
technically take this to 15 minutes after, but that's when we have to do a hard stop. So we do have a little okay. bit more space. Um, uh -huh. Following that question, there was another one, again, just sort of dealing with this language of war on terror. <clears throat> and they asked us, can you reflect on your language and make a comment uh, that October 7th was like 9-11 for Israel? How is this language effectively supporting the stupid idea of war on terror? How exactly is that language helping us reach peace in the world? So they were questioning our use of using that terminology. Um, if somebody would like to, if you'd like to speak to that, Bruce, maybe you're the one that used that language, if you'd like to speak to that. Yeah, let, let me start. Um, I, and I actually thought a lot about this, um, particularly when the Russell Moore piece came out in Christianity Today. Um, and what well, he didn't use war on terror language, but this is a, a fairly influential. He's the senior editor there at, at Christianity Today, which is like the flagship uh, magazine for American Christianity and maybe evangelical Christianity around the world. Um, and he um, he he called for moral clarity, and this was the kind of language that came out right after 9/11, when the, the attacks happened in 9/11. Uh, there was a very binary turn in the thinking of Americans that went from George Bush all the way down. Uh, and you had books published on the subject, all calling for a, a war, uh, sorry, a clarity, a moral clarity that basically reduced the entire um, situation to a, a simple binary that we talked about earlier between good and evil, light and dark, and locating all of the, the good on one side and all the bad on the other. Of course, the Americans were the good, and Al Qaeda was the bad, and and so all we need to do is, you know, cast them, frame them in that, that term, and then whatever we do to them is legitimate. And that kind of language is, yeah, it's been recycled. It's absolutely been recycled. So on the one hand, I want to say yes, October seventh kind of is Israel's nine eleven, but we as Americans really messed up badly in our traumatized response to nine eleven. Uh, maybe maybe you should learn not only from the trauma, but from the mistakes that came out of that and the hundreds of thousands of people that died as a result of this binary paradigm and this, as somebody said, this this framing of the war on terror. Um, I, I don't know how you have a war on a concept. Uh, it's never made any sense to me. Jonathan, do you want to jump on, on that question as well? Yeah, I, I think the language is very important, but but I think what's even more important is asking ourselves as evangelicals, what is it that we believe in? What is it that we can contribute to this conversation? What is it that we can say that's different from the narrative that we hear every day uh, from, from all the, the, the paper? And you hear it the same, as I said, whether you're watching Fox News or MSNBC, you're hearing the same tired uh, political arguments. Do Christians have a different story to sell? Is there a bomb in Gilead? Do we have something to offer other than let's kill them all, let's destroy them all, they are evil, we are good, our friends are good, no matter what they do, our enemies are bad, no matter what they may complain about. Uh, and, and I think we have something to offer. And, and, and the world desperately needs it. Palestinians and Israelis need more than anything else a different perspective. And, and if, if evangelical Christians don't offer it, who's going to offer it? Nobody. Nobody. Mercy? Yeah, I've been saying this is the best time for the church to actually be the church, like be Christians. <laughs> if there's ever an opportune moment, it's now. Um, <clears throat> there's another question here. Um, they they said, I'm aware of Palestinian news sites that give legitimate accounts of what's happening in Israel-Palestine. Can you identify what Israeli or Jewish news sites, where should I go for accurate info on this matter? Um, <laughs> well, you want to take that, Jonathan? Uh, I I don't know. I think Jewish Voice for Peace, if not now, Combatants for Peace, uh, our Jewish organizations, 
uh, rabbis for human rights. Uh, there are Jewish organizations that are really wrestling with these issues. And uh, I know we haven't mentioned it yet, but I always make a point of mentioning that, that anti-Semitism, in this case, anti-Jewish, anti-Jewishness and anti-Judaism is in fact something that's wrong that we should all combat and work against. Just as uh, anti-Palestinianism and Islamophobia are really very dangerous uh, things that, that are uh, creeping all over uh, American society, and we should oppose them all. We should be very clear in our rejection of all bigotry, all racism, all discrimination, whether it's aimed at Muslims or as Jews or at Palestinians or any other group. Uh, we have our political differences and, and we should be entitled to discuss them, but we also should be aware that there are a lot of people out there who are just full of hate and that, that hate Jews, that hate Muslims, that hate Arabs, that hate people of color, uh, on principle, just hate them. Uh, and, and, and I think we should be very aware of such people and we should be forthright in our condemnation of these things. Let me add to that with, without disagreeing at all, that I think it's important to, um, to, you know, as much as we can, as much as we time as we can commit, to, to listen to a really broad range of Israeli and Jewish uh, sources. So I subscribe myself to Haaretz, but I watch and read regularly the uh, Jerusalem Post, Israel Today. And it's even helpful, even though it's difficult, to just watch um, you know, Israeli government uh, daily briefings and other, other um, presentations that um, you know are going to be um, heavily skewed by an Israeli government position. I don't trust any government in a time of war. I think one of the first things that goes as uh, one, one of the first weapons is the truth. Um, so I'm suspicious of all these sources. Um, but I think even within Israel, there's a pretty vigorous uh, spectrum of views, I think even more so than in the U.S. So, for example, Haaretz represents a, a more liberal and moderate position, but the contributors to Haaretz disagree with each other all the time. And, and they disagree with Jerusalem Post people. Um, you could go to Plus 972, which is an online magazine. It's a collection of uh, Jewish and uh, Palestinian or Jewish and Arab Israeli uh, journalists that put out their ideas. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, resource. It, it be, be careful because it's a black hole. You'll get sucked in and this will become uh, all you do all the time, which is sort of what happens to me. Uh, but it really is important not not just to listen to oh those um, left right wing sources because they're so wrong. But how about this? I'm going to listen to those right wing sources because I might learn something. I might learn something that I'm not getting from other sources, and I might learn there's something about the psyche, the 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 trauma, the current perspective, the the struggle that Jews are having in Israel right now because it's a huge struggle. I've been working on this for almost 20 years, and this is like nothing I've ever seen before. So Israel is uh, internally in turmoil, and you can see that in the media, and it's important for us to see it. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. I think it it helps me hold my humanity towards everyone, whether or not I agree with political positions or things that are going on. And so I try to expose myself to a, a wide range. Um, I think we're probably at the point where we need to start winding down now because we do have a few announcements that we need to make um, mm -hmm. in closing. Can we give Jonathan uh, any final word and then uh, turn it over to you for those announcements? Jonathan, you, you've, you've given us a final word a couple of times, so maybe you have said <laughs> what you want to say. That's fine. And we really appreciate um, you know, the wisdom you shared. Uh, I think it's important for us to hear uh, Palestinians, to hear Christians, to hear legal minds, to hear advocates for the way of Jesus, uh, the nonviolent path. Um, do you have any last uh, wisdom for us before, before Mercy offers some? Uh, just thank you so much for being with us today. Any last words from you? No, thanks. I, th I think I've, I've, I've said what <laughs> I wanted to say, especially okay. about trying to, to be Christian to be the church, uh, to, to, to be followers of Jesus, 
and and make that foremost in our uh, approach to Palestine Israel. Mercy, give us your last announce your announcements. <laughs> Last announcement, I just want to echo what Jonathan said and what you said, Bruce. Thank you guys, both of you, for conducting this conversation. Thank you to everyone who came. Um, grateful for this very vigorous conversation that's going on uh, in the chat. And <clears throat> I just want to say that at NIMI, our desire is to bring, as Jonathan has repeated many times, a Christian perspective. We're not just another news agency or activist agency. In fact, that's not what we are aiming to be. We are aiming to shine the to open up within the Christian world a vigorous dialogue concerning Israel-Palestine and to bring to light um, parts of the conversation that many evangelicals in particular have not had access to. So I think that we accomplished that today. <clears throat> um, if you're not signed up with the NIMI newsletter, please go to nimi.network, sign up for our newsletter, like and follow us on social media. And thank you so much for supporting us in this work that we're doing, which um, I will just repeat is we're trying to do something different than the other organizations that you see out there. And we are trying to speak to a different audience. So um, thank you for supporting us in that work financially and with your prayers and with participating in these events. We're really grateful. And I think that's about all that there's left to say. God bless you guys as you go about your day and let's continue to pray and work and be involved for peace and justice in the Holy Land. <laughs>